Thanks, Susie. So over the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about drug-induced lupus and demyelinating neurologic disorders, uh, one or two slides on inflammatory ocular disorders, and a little bit on hypersensitivity reactions to the thiopurines and infliximab. Millie has already covered dermatologic uh, manifestations, and Ed completely covered infectious uh, complications of anti-TNFs and immune suppressants. So we'll start with a case. Uh, this is a 24-year-old Caucasian woman with perforating ileoclonic Crohn's. She underwent an ileocecal resection one year after diagnosis, secondary to perforating disease. Six months after surgery, she underwent a surveillance colonoscopy, which showed moderate recurrence, Rutgert's I2 score at the IC anastomosis. Infliximab, five milligrams per kilogram, was restarted and continued every eight weeks. Ten months after restarting infliximab, she developed severe pain in her hands, knee, and ankle. On physical exam, she had tenderness over the right second and third MCP, second PIP, second DIP, left knee, and tenderness and swelling of the left ankle and a left Achilles tendonitis. Her labs were abnormal. She had an albumin of 3.3, a sed rate of 34, a CRP of 18.5, her ANA was positive at 1 to 640 with a homogenous pattern, and her double-stranded DNA was positive. Uh, rheumatology did additional testing, complement levels, SSA, SSB, CCP, et cetera, which were negative. Um, imaging of her hands, feet, and pelvis were normal. Um, she was given infliximab 10 milligrams per kilogram times one without improvement in her symptoms. So the questions for the first case is, what's the differential diagnosis for her joint symptoms? You strongly suspect drug-induced lupus. How would you confirm the diagnosis, or do you need anything more to confirm the diagnosis? How is drug-induced lupus treated? And if the diagnosis is drug-induced lupus, will the symptoms recur after re-challenge with, re with the same or a different anti-TNF? So paradoxical immune re reactions, the mechanism is not completely known. The most common forms Millie covered is dermatologic with psoriasis and eczematous skin lesions, drug-induced lupus, vasculitis, demyelinating disorders, and interstitial lung disease. The onset of symptoms on average, if you look across all of these disorders, is approximately 41 weeks after starting anti-TNF therapy, but it can range from anywhere from a day to seven years. And I'm going to show you a table here that documents they are more common in women. Um, what's the prognosis of these reactions? After withdrawal of anti-TNF and appropriate treatment, most patients have complete resolution of symptoms. Another 15% will have partial resolution of symptoms, and about 13% will not have any improvement after drug withdrawal. The autoimmune paradoxical reactions with the poorest outcomes are interstitial lung disease and inflammatory ocular disorders with resolution only in 63%. And CNS demyelinating disorders have resolution only in 70%. And we can maybe uh, toss around some reasons why that may be the case. So this is a table I promise you looking at a Spanish cohort of over 800 patients with these paradoxical autoimmune reactions across multiple disease states and multiple meds. You can see that the reported cases out of 800, uh, drug-induced lupus, looking at that alone, is the most common. But if you look at all of the neurologic disorders, they're going to surpass drug-induced lupus. You have optic neuritis, MS, and peripheral neuropathies. You also see inflammatory ocular disease. If you look at the mean age, not surprising, these are primarily RA patients for the most part. They're a little bit higher age than we expect in our population, but again, mostly female underlying disease given the incidence and prevalence of RA is going to be RA with IBD being third and then infliximab and intanercept represent the uh, large percentage of these because they were approved earlier in the process. Now let's focus a little bit about dr on drug-induced lupus. The incidence of drug-induced lupus in randomized controlled trials of anti-TNFs is about f is 14 cases in 1,840 patients or 0.76%. In the post-marketing surveillance, it's about the same, maybe a little lower with infliximab. It's 0.19 to 0.22 percent. With adalimumab, it's 0.1 percent. Common presenting symptoms are asthenia, malaise, fever, rash, arthralgias, or myalgias. Renal and central nervous system involvement is not common with drug-induced lupus. 
This is a study looking at a single center, which actually had a very, very high rate of drug-induced lupus, confirming that it was more common in women. Median duration of therapy in this study was about one year. All of the patients in this cohort had joint pain at presentation, and about a third of them had fatigue and dermatitis as well. All of them had a positive ANA, and 80% had a positive double-stranded DNA. In this cohort, all patients stopped the anti-TNF, and 40% required steroids to resolve symptoms. The median duration of symptom resolution was about eight months, which in my experience is a bit long. 70% were restarted on a different anti-TNF, and only one of these patients had recurrence of their drug-induced lupus, but to caution you there, the follow-up was quite short. So it would seem that an ANA and double-stranded DNA would, would be very helpful, but in fact, uh, being, having a positive ANA on anti-TNF is very common. If you look at the pivotal trials of infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab, you can see that with infliximab, over 50% of patients will have a positive ANA defined as greater than, greater than or equal to 1 to 80, um, and over 25% will have a positive double-stranded DNA. Uh, the incidence of positive ANA and double-stranded DNA is lower with adalimumab and sertilizumab, but still present. So using those alone to diagnose drug-induced lupus can be uh, tricky, and certainly checking these proactively and making changes based on the results uh, is something that I wouldn't recommend. The, what's the differential? So in this patient, we'd have to consider a delayed hypersensitivity reaction to infliximab either arthralgias associated with active disease or a type 1 arthritis associated with active IBD, type 2 arthritis or other forms of arthritis or even fibromyalgia, although the, the presence of joint swelling and tendonitis argues against that. Um, I really find that this patient in clinic who develops joint pain on anti-TNF is a very difficult patient to try to figure out what the etiology of the symptoms are. And I'm just going to briefly review some of these other disorders that aren't paradoxical reactions. So most commonly in our patients with IBD, uh, arthralgias are the most common joint manifestation. They occur in 18 to 16 percent of patients with IBD, and they're more common in patients with Crohn's. They can affect any joint and usually coincide with active disease, and they reemerge with relapse, and they should resolve with treatment of the flare. The type 1 arthritis, also known as posyarticular arthritis associated with IBD, is more common than the polyarticular form. It's usually acute and self-limited, lasting less than 10 weeks. It typically involves less than five joints, including one large weight-bearing joint, it usually coincides with active disease. It's associated with other EINs like erythema nodosum and uveitis. Lasts a mean of five weeks, um, but 10 to 20 percent of people can have chronic symptoms, and it can recur in less than half. Radiographs, as in this case, are typically normal. Now, the more difficult form to uh, sort out is this polyarticular arthritis associated with IBD, which typically affects five or more joints typically the small joints in the hands, particularly the MCPs, usually does not correlate with the underlying bowel activity and can in fact occur prior uh, to diagnosis or even after colectomy. The mean duration is about three years of symptoms and it's also associated with ocular EIMs with uveitis. The diagnostic criteria for drug-induced lupus is peripheral arthritis manifested by symmetric or asymmetric, very intense joint pain positive ANA, double-stranded DNA. Supporting features include fatigue, dermatitis, and a positive antihistone antibody. Often you're going to need a, dermatolo or a rheumatologist to help you sort through this. Treatment is removal of the offending anti-TNF agent, and that needs to happen in 95% of cases. Supportive care using celecoxib and uh, the um, uh, selective COX-2 inhibitors, tapering courses of prednisone and immune suppressants are needed in about half and 13% respectively, and in this series, 99% of cases resolved. So the second case is going to be a uh, neurologic uh, paradoxical autoimmune uh, reaction. This is a 25-year-old white man with a history of ulcerative colitis, status post-colectomy, IPAA, and ileostomy reversal in 2005. A year after ileostomy reversal, he developed increased bloody stools and nocturnal incontinence. He was treated with metronidazole with complete resolution of his symptoms. 
Unfortunately, his symptoms recurred rapidly, requiring intermittent antibiotics, and he eventually lost response to antibiotics completely. He had a pouchoscopy, which confirmed moderate endoscopically active pouchitis. He had been treated with infliximab around the time of his colectomy and was restarted on it, but developed a severe delayed hypersensitivity reaction that recurred with attempts at reinfusion. He was changed to adalimumab with conventional loading and maintenance therapy. And on follow-up after induction, he reported weakness of his right wrist and foot. His neurologic exam, although by a gastroenterologist, showed absent bicep and patellar reflexes bilaterally. Four out of five wrist extensor strength, wrist flexors, plantar flexors, and dorsiflexors. So he's definitely weak. So what's the cause of his weakness? What are the appropriate next diagnostic steps? Um, if this is a demyelinating syndrome related to anti-TNF use, how do you manage the condition and how do you manage his IBD-specific medication? So this is actually not his MRI, so if there's any neurologist here checking up on me to see if the distribution is correct, this is not his, but it's an axial T2 showing a cerebellar lesion in another patient of mine and another look at it in a coronal view. So in a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and post-marketing surveillance, the estimate of this, these disorders is about 0.05 to 0.2 percent. The pathogenesis, pathogenesis is not confirmed. Um, theories for this are T-cell and humoral attack against peripheral myelin, vasculitis-induced neural ischemia, and inhibition of signaling support of axons. We really don't know why these occur. The type of neurologic disorders associated with anti-TNF or demyelination and optic neuritis and peripheral neuropathy are most common, but there are a host of other neurologic disorders we can see in patients treated with anti-TNF, including PML. So one of the questions is, the, is does the anti-TNF cause MS or does MS already exist in patients with IBD? And this is what I was getting at with um, about a third of patients don't have resolution of symptoms with drug withdrawal. There was a, a nice study done looking at um, MRIs of pa M brain MRIs of patients with IBD that were asymptomatic compared to controls, and they found that focal white matter lesions were present in 31 patients with Crohn's, which was 43%, compared to eight controls, or only 16%. And it didn't seem to matter as far as percentages, whether they were Crohn's or UC. So in your patient you're seeing in clinic about to start drug, they have no symptoms, there's a fairly high percentage of patients that are going to have white matter changes. In addition, the incidence of MS has increased in patients with IBD. So a study out of Olmsted County showed that 1% of their patients had concurrent IBD and MS. In a study from Manitoba, the incidence of MS was 1.6 and 1.4 percent in patients with Crohn's and UC, respectively. The general population rate was only 0.9 percent. And in another study from uh, the GPRD database in the UK, MS was uh, two and a half to two times more common in patients with UC and Crohn's. So the treatment of these disorders is withdrawal of the anti-TNF agent. And um, I would not recommend you restart the anti-TNF as this is likely a class effect, and there are reports of worsening when an anti-TNF is restarted. Treatment is typically with corticosteroids. In severe cases, you can consider plasmapheresis and IVIG. A study looked at follow-up of five patients with demyelinating complications revealed that three out of five had mild to moderate disability. And in the two patients, the MRI and the case presentation I had in this case, uh, they resolve without any sequela at all. So I just have one slide on inflammatory ocular disorders. Um, in that Spanish uh, registry that I mentioned of 800 patients, they had 87 reports of inflammatory ocular disease after starting biologic therapies. The role of the anti-TNF in these disorders is unclear, especially when the ocular disorders run counter to disease activity, which occurs in um, psoriatic arthritis and IBD. What about rechallenge in general in patients that have had these paradoxical reactions? So this is in general looking across all of these different autoimmune diseases. Um, there were 54 reported cases of anti-TNF being restarted in a registry in 17. The same anti-TNF was restarted. Not surprisingly, in two-thirds two of the cases, the symptoms recur. 
In 37 cases, the anti-TNF was changed to a different anti-TNF, and recurrence was in about a third. Um, duration of use in the new, of the new anti-TNF in this case series wasn't known, so it's not clear if these things would have emerged with greater use of the second anti-TNF. So just briefly on hypersensitivity reactions, I was also supposed to talk about immune modulators as well. And the only thing I really came across was hypersensitivity reactions to thiopurines, which occur in about 5 to 10% of our patients treated with azathioprine, typically early in treatment within the first month, and it doesn't appear to be dose-dependent. Um, the imidazole component of azathioprine may bind to endogenous proteins, resulting in formation of haptin. Um, this is a pretty um, awful symptom complex of fever, chills, arthralgias, myalgias, cutaneous eruptions, leukocytosis, and you can see liver or renal dysfunction and rarely shock. Um, in general, in patients that are intolerant to azathioprine, if you switch to 6-MP, about half of patients will be able to tolerate the switch over, except when you're talking about the hypersensitivity reaction I'm describing here. In fact, most patients will have recurrent symptoms if you try to switch them to 6-MP, so that's not recommended. Hypersensitivity reaction to infliximab, uh, we don't see it as much anymore because we don't do as much on-demand therapy, uh, but these have been described by Adam Chaffetz in a re nice review occurring about a day to 14 days after infusion. Uh, they're characterized by arthralgias, myalgias, uh, urticaria, fever, and or malaise. When I've seen these, the real um, uh, hallmark of this is intense stiffness, where patients really describe not being able to sit down because they're so stiff. Uh, they tend to resolve with conservative treatment with acetaminophen, antihistamines, and even a short course of like a medrol dose pack. You can try to rechallenge patients in this situation. If they've had a long drug holiday, you should check uh, infliximab or uh, infliximab levels and antibodies to infliximab, and if they have high levels, you should not rechallenge. But otherwise, you can try to rechallenge uh, with treatment with methylprednisolone before the infusion and a medrol dose pack after to try to prevent the symptoms. So take-home points, paradoxical autoimmune reactions occur in about 10% of patients treated with anti-TNF. Millie's actually spear, spearheading a registry to gain more an understanding of these disorders and get a real true prevalence of, of these. Most resolve completely with cessation of anti-TNF with or without specific treatment of the paradoxical autoimmune reaction. I think the diagnosis of drug-induced lupus can be extremely difficult. There's a high rate of positive ANA and double-stranded DNA in patients on anti-TNF. Other disorders can have a similar presentation, um, but they, when they do occur, they may not recur with rechallenge with a different anti-TNF. The neurologic disorders are less likely to completely resolve, and I don't recommend rechallenging those patients. Hypersensitivity reactions to azathioprine and infliximab are common. Do not rechallenge patients that develop fever on azathioprine with 6-MP, and you may continue patients with infliximab if they have a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, as long as they don't have high titer antibodies, and I would consider pre and post medications in those patients. Thank you very much.